Good morning, St. Andrews. We are so excited to have you worship with us this morning. We're going to get started. If you'll sing along, we would love for you to join us. We cannot wait till next week when you can all be here with us. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. worship. Every day is a great day to be in worship. Amen? Amen. And we're so happy that you've decided to join us this morning. We know there's lots of other places you could be, but we're glad that you're here with us. If you have friends or family you want to invite, just click on the invite button in the chat screen, and it will allow any, anyone in your contacts to join us right now in worship. Also, take a quick minute. Let us know you're here. Uh, there's a connect card that you can fill out. Remember, you only need to put one person in the name field, and then you can add all the other house, household members in um, after you do that. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to be praying for you. We are a praying church. And we want to be praying for you and whatever is going on in your life. So if you'll just add your prayer request, you can put it in the chat screen if you'd like. Or you can go to our website and send it in there. 
Next Sunday, we will be open for our in-person worship at 945. And 1115. And we can't wait to see you all here. We will be live streaming both services still. So if you don't want to come into, into the service, that's fine. Make sure that you're checking us out online and keep live streaming that way. Um, also, we encourage you to check out our reopening page. You can go to saumc.life to do that. And it will kind of give you all the things that are going on and a heads up as far as what to expect when you come. Um, we are so excited to continue in worship with you this morning. It is so nice to see faces. You don't know how much I missed you guys. So we're excited to have you. Let's continue worshiping this morning. I pray that you will just open your hearts, open your minds, and hear whatever it is that God has for you this morning. blood is one and children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up high don't fear no evil fix your eyes on Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Oh, 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 oh. Sing that again. Oh. Oh, 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 Everything with the red, we keep the sound. 
Fully 
It is at this time we enter a time of prayer. And I ask that you, at this point, before we start our, our prayer time, that you take a time of silence, a silent prayer, uh, to center your thoughts and to center your focus on Christ and his love for us and that you, you are known by him. So let's have a moment of silent prayer. God of this new day, we praise you on this day with joy. And the days we live in, uh, we take our weary lives, are so weary, but refresh us with your spirit. On this new morning, we ask you to cleanse us, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our minds, inspire our worship. And give us grace, Lord, not only to hear your word with our ears, but to receive it in our hearts so that we can live it out in our lives. Our hearts are troubled and our spirits fearful. This coronavirus in the wildfire continues to raise their devastation here in our nation. Have mercy on all who are in the path of the wildfires. And there are those within this congregation who have significant concerns. And we pray for those who are in the hospital, who are recovering from home. We pray for those who are suffering illnesses and facing challenging and troubled times in this, in this world, in this time of our lives. And we pray for those who are mourning the loss of someone dear to them. We lift up Florence Gustafson and her family and the loss of her husband, Al. Send your comforting presence to all and in your mercy hear our prayer. Oh God, who you taught us to keep all your commandments by simply just loving you and loving our neighbor. Give us a spirit of grace and peace that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united with each other in one spirit. You have given each of us gifts and have called each of us into the ministry of your church in using these gifts. Help us to step out of our comfort zone and to discover the calling you have given us. Lord, we may know that you can... We can trust you to supply all our needs, but still we often struggle. We doubt, letting our fears cried out our, crowd out our faith. Forgive us. Help us to trust you in every moment, for every need, for everything. We know that nothing can separate us from you through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we offer this prayer. And we pray the prayer together he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. My name is Reverend Jane Rideout, and um, I am the other half of the co-lead with my husband Gary and I, and I'm so happy to be worshiping with you today. Now, some of you are at home saying, I'm a little confused because next week is our opening, but you're hearing some people here today. So you're right, because there are a group of amazing people are in the sanctuary right now, and those are our volunteers who are going to help us over the next weeks and months to keep the sanctuary safe for other people to come in by um, cleaning in between the services, uh, making sure everybody has a mask and is well greeted. So I want you to know that there is a group of amazing folks here today 
who, because of their willingness to serve, will all be able to be together next week. And so I just want to express my gratitude to, the, to those of you who are here today. You are, you are wonderful. Uh, it's also, if you're at home, do know, we don't have any air conditioning here today, so if I look like I'm hot, yeah, it's accurate. So, um, we're, it's, but they are on it, and it should be fixed any minute now. Um, do you have, like, a favorite sermon? Like, maybe a sermon that you heard maybe a long time ago, and you have never forgotten it. I've got two that come to mind when I think about favorite sermons. One is not a really good example. I was 16 years old. I was in church. I was always in church. And a preacher preached on the scripture Luke 8, 17. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. I had never heard it before that day. And that scripture is, for all that is secret will eventually be bought, brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. I was 16 years old when I had that verse, and I was scared to death, and I couldn't wait for it to end so I could get down to the altar and get right with God before my parents figured out the stuff I was doing. So that's not a good reason to really remember a sermon. But I have another one that was a sermon I heard back in um, 1996, and I've never forgotten it. In fact, I had fun this week just thinking about it. Um, there was a gentleman, Dr. Um, Haddon Robinson, and he was the preaching uh, professor at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. And he was really renowned. He'd written a lot of books. And he was um, coming to our seminary. Now, that year, he had been voted by Baylor University as one of the top 12 preachers in the United States. And so, I mean, I was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to get to hear this guy. He's like an amazing preacher. In fact, to this day, he's on a list of the top 25 preachers over the past 25 years. He was like amazing. And so he was coming, and I was so pumped and excited. And he actually preached on the parable that we are going to talk about today. And it's not even a parable that I like. It's kind of a scary parable. But I am so excited to preach on this for the very first time, and I think you are going to be blessed by it. And I'll tell you a little more about Professor, Professor Robinson as we go on. But before we start that, I want to just invite those of you at home, if you would like to add to the chat screen right now something, a little bit of conversation, if you have a favorite sermon that came to mind when I said, oh, I have a favorite sermon, go ahead and put that in the chat space. And you could just either tell us what it was about, or you could say who the pastor was, anything you want. Just say, hey, I got one, and say something about it. And we would love to see if other people have favorite sermons. So let's go ahead, and we're going to begin with our scripture lesson today. It's in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And this is the words of Jesus who is teaching about um, final judgment. And that would be after Christ returns. And so I'm reading out of Matthew 25. Now when the human one comes in all his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him and he will separate them from each other just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats will be put on his left then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous, will reply to him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When do we see you as a stranger and welcome you or, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When do we see you sick or in prison or visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, get away from me. You who, will receive, you who will receive terrible things, go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and didn't do anything to help you? And then he will answer them. I assure you that when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous ones will go into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so today we are continuing the sermon series. This is actually week five called Walk the Walk. And over the past five weeks, we have been focusing on the different amazing ministries at St. Andrews. It has been so much fun for, for Gary and I as new pastors to, to hear about the amazing work this church has been doing for so many years. And today we're going to focus on Meals on Wheels, which we've already seen a little video about. And then we're also going to talk about the food pantry. And we're so excited to do that. But first, let's kind of go back to that parable and let's hear a little bit more about it. So I want you to know something. So for those early hearers of this story, when Jesus told this story, it was probably most likely a group of Jewish people. This would have rocked their world. They would have heard this, Jesus giving them a standard by which they would have judged th themselves to see if they were right with God, and they would have been just so upset. You see, for a Jewish person in the first century, they had two standards by which they were told to judge themselves. The first standard was simple. It was the law that had been given to them through Moses. The law and all of its statutes and the Ten Commandments. And their call was to follow the law. That was how they judged themselves. But there was also a second standard, and this was much easier. This standard had to do with, were you born a Jew? Because the Jewish culture believed, the Jewish faith in the first century believed, well, the other nations would be given a standard by God in which they would be judged. But for the Jewish people, they had a different standard. In fact, that standard was no standard because they simply, because they were the chosen people, they were okay with God. And so they had a very, very different experience, and they had a, a strong self-identity about who they were. And they knew they were right with God just because they were Jews. And then Jesus came, and he's saying something really radical to them. He's saying something that they hadn't heard before. He's basically saying that you're going to be judged by the reaction you have to the needs of others. That would have been radical. That would have been upsetting. That would have been scary to them. And I don't know how you experienced this, this passage. My, my husband says, oh, he's had good memories of this passage. And I said, oh, this has always been a scary passage to me. I mean, it's, it's one of those things you hear, and it, it depends how it's being presented to you. But this is a scary standard. It says that we are accountable to our, for our deeds or our lack of deeds. And so I, I think that's, that's a little hard to hear. One of the very interesting first points of this particular um, parable that we kind of have to take note of the details when you read scripture is one is that the people hearing, the people being um, separated, the sheep and the goats, have one thing in common. They're both perplexed by what Jesus said because they don't seem to understand when they had been obedient. They didn't understand that their response to the needs of the others needed, was going to be unconscious and spontaneous. And what does that mean? Well, it basically means that Jesus is praising those who have no expectations in their giving. What does that mean? It means you, you do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because it's something you get back. You, you don't do the right thing so that someone will thank you or praise you or think more highly of you so that you will be recognized for your great deeds. In fact, you're supposed to actually do it sort of quietly so nobody knows what you've done. You're just supposed to do it because you identify as a sheep, as a follower of Jesus. You just do it. And that's kind of like hard to hear because i got to be honest with you. I do things because I identify as a sheep, and I know it's the right thing to do, but I also like the praise. I like to be thanked. I like when people notice. I mean, I'll be really honest. It's like when someone doesn't thank you or no one notices, you feel a little bad. But I, I, I want to help you with that a little bit today. I, I've grown peace with this in that 
I can't change my personality. I'm sort of a people per, um, person. I'm a people pleaser. But what I can understand is why I do what I do and stick to that. I do what I do because I want to be a sheep. I want to live out what Jesus is asking of us. And what he's basically saying is that we are called to be kind and gracious with whatever resource we have. It's really simple. We're called to respond to the needs right in front of us. Sometimes, sometimes that isn't always so easy. I want to go back to my, my, um, the pastor, my favorite sermon by Dr. Haddon Robinson. This week, as I was thinking back to 1996, it was, I got all like, I said to Gary, it was pre-children. It was, um, well, we got married in, I guess, 97. So it was pre-marriage, pre-children, and it was pre-being um, a pastor. And it was an exciting time. Um, Gary and I were both attending the Asbury Theological Seminary. And I was so excited to be a pastor. Oh, my gosh. And one of the things I like about being a pastor is preaching. And so I was taking classes how to be a better preacher. And now this renowned gentleman was coming. And he was going to come and preach at our seminary. And I was going to get to hear him preach. And that meant maybe I would become a better preacher. And I was so pumped and excited because that's why you go to seminary. And so I was so excited he got there. And he, and he preached on this passage about the sheep and the goats. And as he was preaching, he told this story, and I never forgot it. In fact, I could give you a lot more detail, but I won't, but it's just, it was such a life-changing story for me. He talked about how he was studying that scripture passage, and he'd been really, you know, meditating on it in his heart, which is what pastors do. You chew on scripture for a long time, and you read commentaries, and you chew it anymore, and you kind of let God talk to you about it. And so he was doing, going through that process, and, and he said, I threw myself into the category of the sheep because he says, I am a generous person, and I follow the, the, the teachings of Jesus. And so he says, I kind of saw myself as a sheep. And one day when he was praying and thinking about this passage, he said, Jesus, when, when did I feed you? When did I clothe you? And he said, immediately his brain, as our brains do when we pray, went to that award he had gotten from Baylor University, that list he had made as one of the top 12 best preachers. I think it was actually in all the English-speaking um, countries. I mean, it's huge. And in fact, that year, I think that was listed in Time Magazine, because I remember, I think I remember reading that in Time Magazine. He was getting a lot of attention. You know, pastors, they don't get attention like that. I mean, nobody, you know, really cares who's a great pastor, but that was a lot of attention. And he just said, that's when his brain went to. He was like, God, when was I a, a sheep? And his, his brain went there. And he said, I was only there a minute or so when God said, <clears throat> had no. That's not when you fed me. He said, Hadden, remember last week at the end of class, you were heading out, and you noticed there was a girl over in the corner still sitting in her seat, a student. And as you went by, you, you said, are you okay? And, and she said, yeah. And you started to move on, and then you sort of felt that little feeling in your heart. And he said, and he paused, and he said, are you sure? Are you sure you're okay? And then she paused. And so he put down his briefcase and he sat down. And he talked to her. And God said, that's when you fed my sheep. That's when you clothed the naked. That is when you were a sheep to me. That was sort of life-changing for me. I thought being a preacher was going to be about preaching and teachings and weddings and funerals and baptisms. And in that moment, I, I suddenly had this aha moment. It was going to be about every interruption that I was going to encounter over the rest of my life. Every time I paused to give somebody my ear, my words, my thoughts, that, that was really when I was going to feed the sheep. That was really when I was going to feed Christ. 
there is this ministry here, and we, we all, already just touched on it. It's called Meals on Wheels. And I don't know that everybody knows St. Andrew's that. It's, it's been a long time running ministry here, but through COVID, they never stopped. There is a group of folks that every Tuesday meet over in the kitchen in the Family Life Center, and they make meals for anywhere between 45 and 85 people. It's a little lower now during COVID. But they make meals for people who wouldn't possibly eat if it wasn't for that. There's this, this group of, 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 of cooks under, um, that gather, and they, and they just cook and do this. And, and then there's a separate group of people that pick the meals up and deliver them to the homes. The, the chefs never meet the people in the homes. The drivers do, and the drivers take the food to the people. And sometimes, especially during COVID, that has been the only interaction that, dri that person at home has had is with the deliverer of the meal. That is the only contact they have had. I mean, I, I, I sat with the... Um, I sat with the two leaders, um, Bonnie McGrew and, and Joyce Winters, and I kept saying, why do you do it? Why do you do it? And they're like, because it's a need. Someone asked me to help, and I started helping, and it's a need. They're not doing it for the glory. Nobody knows what they're doing. Through COVID, they've been meeting the needs, not for the praise, but because the need is there. There's another aspect to this parable that we can't miss because this is the hard part of this parable. This is, this is the part where um, we may struggle a bit because what we learn in this parable also is that giving is indiscriminate. It doesn't say anything about you only give to those who truly have a need. It says you give to the need in front of you. I remember one time giving some money to a guy on the street Gave him probably a five or something, whatever I had in my pocket. And about an hour later, I saw him walking down the street counting a huge wad of cash. And I was so mad and so indignant, like, oh, he took advantage of me. And sometimes we kind of decide in our minds, you know, unless I'm, I'm gonna, only going to give to an institution because if I give to someone on the street, they may go buy liquor or, or drugs. But the story doesn't make that differentiation. In fact, I want to tell you a story about a guy who kind of, you know, didn't want to be taken advantage of. And one day he made a really big lunch. And he said this big lunch was sitting in his truck next to him. And he was sitting at a light and there was someone begging. And he said, what went through my mind is what always goes through my mind when I see someone begging, like, get a job, buddy. And he, the light changed and he started going around the corner. And he said, as he made the turn, God said to him in that moment, why are you not willing to share your lunch? It was a life-changing moment for him. He never questioned that was God's voice. So he started carrying bags of food in his car, things that wouldn't go bad in the heat, like maybe a granola bar or, 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 or water or little kinds of food that had canned food that you could just flip open and eat out of, a little sausages, stuff like food that, that wouldn't go bad. And he kept the bag in his truck, and before you knew it, the, the small group he belonged to, they all kept a bag in their car, and then pretty, pretty much everyone in the church eventually kept a bag in their car. They were called street eats, and they were to feed the people because we don't get to decide who's actually hungry and who's not. Sometimes we are given opportunities to care for the people in front of us. And I want to say today that it's going to be different for all of us because we all have different worlds. We run into different people in our worlds. You know, I, you may never see a homeless person, but you may see somebody who needs someone to listen to them, to smile at them, to be gracious to them. I don't know right now, especially during COVID, that person might be someone in your family. I don't know. But what this, this parable is teaching us is that God loves us so very much that he tells us what it, how we can judge ourselves so that we can be right with him. He literally gives us instructions on how to be sheep, how to, to live a successful life, how to be the people Jesus calls us to be. He literally tells us how out of his love for us. And then we simply have to meet the need in front of us. 
And sometimes, as a congregation, we need to meet the need in front of our church. So we've talked about Meals on Wheels, but there's actually another ministry in our church that is all about feeding people, and that is the food pantry. The food pantry has been around for a long time, and again, many of you may not know that the food pantry has been um, giving out food during COVID. Not the entire time, but they are now. And what we are seeing every single week is this increase in the giving, the, in the needs of the community. Where we started out with just a need for a few bags, it just suddenly skyrocketed. We, we're only offering on Wednesdays from 9 to 11, but people just keep showing up and showing up. It's a need in the community. And thankfully, because there's so many generous, gracious people in this congregation, by the grace of God, we have met the needs. But the needs seem to be growing. And so we want to share an opportunity for, with you. An opportunity to answer the need in front of us, in front of St. Andrews. It's called a compassion station. And you'll hear more about it, but what you could do is be a compassion station host. And what does that mean? A compassion station is just a big um, container that you would either put in front of your house or put at your place of work. And it would have, we will provide you with laminated signs that explain what it is that anything you bring in will be delivered to St. Andrews to, to stock the shelves of our food pantry. There are actually flyers we can give you that you can pass out to people in your neighborhood. Gary and I are gonna do this. I don't know anyone in my neighborhood. So here's my opportunity. I'm going to put one in front of my garage and I'm gonna to go to my neighborhood, I'm gonna knock on doors, I'm gonna introduce myself, and there's some of them people are gonna think I'm nuts, and I'm gonna hand them a flyer and I'm gonna say, hey, if you wanna help feed the poor, but sometimes you get busy and it's, you, you may not make it here to drop off the food, it's really easy. Here's the food we need, and you can put it in that bucket every week and I'll deliver it for you. It's a crazy idea, but other churches are doing this and it actually works. I'm not going to worry what people think, and I'm not even going to worry. I can, I can lay in bed worrying at night that someone's going to steal from it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to be bold and do something crazy to meet the needs that are in this community. And I want to challenge you all to do the same. You see, this parable is really, really simple. Where do you see the need? What is the need? Meet it. And I know the God that we all serve, who loves us so much, will have placed the need in front of us that we can, that we can handle. I know that about him. But if you see a need and you're a little overwhelmed by it, don't do it in your own strength. Ask God to help you. Ask God to give you the strength to be bold. Ask God to help you do the right thing, to listen one more time, to be gracious one more time, to share your resources one more time. And he will meet your need because he desires to bless us all. He just asks that we bless the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Loving God, I am so grateful to you that you are a God that loves us so much that you actually tell us what is required of us, that you love us so much that you lead and guide us, and then you provide us with the opportunities to be obedient to you. I thank you, God, that you are, that you are the one that surrounds us with your continual grace and that you will help us and give us to do the strength and to meet the needs of Brandon. We thank you and we praise you, and I thank you for this amazing church who loves you with their whole heart and so desires to serve you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Welcome to the Food Pantry. I'm Carol Menny. 
On July 8th, we reopen our pantry for our community and for the members of our church to drive by and pick up a bag of groceries. On that first day, we only had seven cars drive through, but now a month and a half later, we had 53 cars and we had to close it off and we missed seven people who were driving through and we ran out of food. In each bag that we give, you can see the different foods that we put in there, but also um, through donations on Meals on Wheels, they have supplied us with some extra of their food, um, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, butter, and um, that also has been put into the bag. On Wednesdays from 9 to 11, um, you can drive through the parking lot and pick up a bag of food. And on Mondays from 9 to 11, you can drop off donations at the church. There are two shopping carts at the end of the sidewalk where you can place your donations. If you're interested in making a monetary donation, you may write a check to St. Andrews United Methodist Church and place um, on the memo, just put the food pantry. Each bag costs uh, about $15. We are really excited about a new program that is being, going to be put in place called Compassion Stations. So stay tuned and we will share more information later on. I just want to thank each and every one of you for the amazing donations you have given to the food pantry. I am just overwhelmed. The um, shelves are full now, but that's for your contribution that you gave today on Monday. Um, I am just so appreciative of your donation to the food pantry. You really are a blessing and you're a blessing to those who need the food the most. Even during this coronavirus pandemic, the outreach of the church does not stop, especially this church, as we've discovered, St. Andrews United Methodist Church, is still out there reaching out to people in need, uh, blessing people in the community and in our church. So we, we, they're touching lives of so many people in the, in the community. So your giving allows the church to continue these ministries, such as food pantries, such as Meals on Wheels, and continue to serve and share God's love, even in these trying times like this. We know many of you are under financial strain yourself, but if you feel led this morning to give, there's a giving link in the chat screen, and you can email a check to St. Andrews. We want to thank you. Thank you so much for your unwavering faith and your willingness to, to, lead, to know, lead people to know God and experience His grace through Jesus Christ. I've carried a burden for too long on my own, and I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I see you
Have a great week. We'll see you next week at 945.